I just want to start by uh, thanking Christine and everyone um, who is here for having me and for all of you for turning up today. And I just have to start by expressing how excited I am to be speaking from a pulpit. I've always wanted to speak from a pulpit, so <laughs> when there was the option, <laughs> when there was the option of coming in the front and speaking at, normally as a facilitator and educator and a grassroots organizer, I want to be as close to people as possible, but when the option of the pulpit was presented, I thought, it's too beautiful to pass up. So I want to start by acknowledging that we're on Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Skohomish lands, specifically unceded Coast Salish territories. And to start out by saying that I'm on this land as a settler, and as I talk about my experiences of being Muslim today, I want to re-emphasize to myself, and perhaps for all of us, that the fight against Islamophobia here must be foregrounded always in the fight for indigenous self-determination. And I also just want to thank the previous reader because I provided that poem from Faz Ahmed Faz, who is someone who has inspired my work for so long, and I grew up with my father translating his work for me, just how meaningful and how moving it was to hear Faz's words read from up here at a church in these times, because I think the reason I chose that poem is because I think it's sadly topical today as well. And it's really important to also kind of underscore the ways in which Pakistanis and Muslims were connecting around international and intersectional struggles from a very early time, not just today. So I struggled a bit to put together notes for today, and normally I'd speak just kind of off the cuff, but it's been a really hard time, and I think that was referenced earlier. Um, it was hard for me to come up and it was to share really anything after the last few days. It's not because there isn't a lot to say. It's because this last week has been so very hard for many of us, especially for Muslims, for racialized bodies, for racialized queer and trans bodies, for indigenous people. Um, I just wanted to start by then explaining why it was so hard and give a snapshot of yesterday and how hard yesterday was and some of the things that happened for me. So I guess a day or part of a day in the life of a Muslim. So 6 a.m. yesterday, I woke up in a panic from a sleep filled with nightmares about my family and other Muslim families being taken away. 7 a.m., I read on-the-ground reports from flooding in from across the world about people being banned from the U.S., from all the countries that Trump has banned. Immigrants, green card holders, refugees, people with status, without status, being deported, being detained, being cuffed, full body and cavity searches, being held for hours, families torn apart, things that unfortunately resonate for me and have on a personal level. 8 a.m., I text my family in the U.S. across the border, some of them with precarious status. I ask, are you okay? Which really sounds like a dumb question because I know they're not. My mom says and asks me, are they going to put us in camps, Amal? I pause because I don't know how to answer that question because I can't really say, unequivocally say, it won't happen. I want to say no, but I can't. My mother sends me photos of her with my sister and my dad at the Seattle Women's March. They were at the first, they were at the first anti-racism rally that I organized years ago when I was 19 years old at the University of Victoria. It was the first anti-racism rally and march that took place on that campus. And among the people at that rally, so obvious in their suits and their headsets, were members of CSIS, the Canadian Secret Service. I remember my mother warning me then and saying, I'm worried about you because you don't have citizenship. And this is really precarious, what you're doing. And even being a citizen with the privileges, not much has changed since then. 8.30 a.m., I tell my mom, I'm proud that you marched. I'm really, really proud of you. And then, after a pause, I say the thing I don't want to. I say, don't do it again. I'm afraid. Lay low. Don't march. 9 a.m., I worry about family with precarious status. I start messaging Muslim friends or getting messages from them. Libyan friends here, Afghan friends in the U.S., Iraqi, Iranian, other Muslims from all over, all of us worried about what happens next, knowing that this is nothing new and this has been something that has been in existence for us since colonialism, but the escalation is still frightening. 10 a.m., I ask my parents how the American neighbors are being next to them. I know there is a libertarian next door who told my dad he hated Muslims and that he has guns. He told this to my father, who's a survivor of a heart attack at the U.S.-Canada border due to racial profiling. 
10.30 a.m., I read about a mosque being burnt down in Texas, not long after a mosque is burnt down in Bellevue, not far from my folks. The rest of the day, news pours in. It's unbearable. A refugee woman tries to commit suicide at JFK airport on the way to being deported. So many different kinds of news, all of it unbearable. A Somali Muslim friend and I, both with family in the US, message each other with prayers and love because that's all we have left. Later, we visit Palestinian friends and we talk about Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's public tweet saying, Israel built a wall to keep out illegals and it worked, and congratulating Trump on building his in the future. Yesterday, bringing it back to a Canadian context, Trudeau tweeted that refugees from banned countries were welcome here instead of the US where they were being banned. People celebrated and shared that picture of him with a refugee child. Yet, he put a recent cap on refugee sponsorships from Iraq and Syria, very recently. Also in place under Trudeau still, a legacy of previous prime ministers in this government, is a safe third country agreement, which means it's practically, it's actually literally impossible for people from the US fleeing and wanting to claim refugee status in, the Canada, in Canada to do so. All things we can work on. Also under Trudeau, Trudeau, we currently have the legacy of Bill C-51, which criminalizes not just Muslim people, indigenous people, and others voicing any dissent against the government, speaking out, making no-fly lists secret, among other things. In the same day, though, other things happened. Resistance happened yesterday. News came in about a Bellevue mosque being housed by a church, the same mosque that was burned down. News came in about massive protests at airports across the U.S., airports becoming a zone of resistance, despite the fact that in Seattle, police showed up with grenade guns, pepper sprayed and cuffed and arrested people. Still, people were out in thousands and thousands. Lawyers on the ground from the ACLU, grassroots lawyers, including people of color, fighting all night, camping out, ensuring that people were freed. You might have heard that there was a temporary stay achieved by lawyers in the US on the ban. It is temporary and it doesn't impact people who are actually not currently in transit, but it's a step, a huge step. Even more amazingly, taxi drivers at JFK, so many of them Muslim, so many of them with precarious status. Yesterday, they mounted a strike for hours in protest of the ban of these countries by Donald Trump. My parents' other neighbor was the one who invited them to come to the Women's March. Yesterday, my Palestinian friend's eight-year-old daughter showed me her art pledging to save the earth and all of its animals. So just moving from that little snapshot of a small part of a day, it's, you know, and I'm, I'm not up here to talk about and represent all Muslims, I'm just giving my perspective on what it's like for me as a queer Muslim. One of the things that I think Christine had, uh, you know, um, talked to me about and sent me some questions on was just to talk a little bit about my reality. And I thought what I would start with then was to be really honest about why it was a struggle to even put together coherence in these last few days, because that was just a few hours of what happened yesterday. But I wanna also talk a little bit about my spirituality, my art, and my activism and how they fuse together. Um, so, you know, in choosing Fez Ahmed Fez, I chose that poem because I'm inspired by the legacy of him and other warrior poets poets of the people, and I really believe the role of poets is to speak the unspeakable, bear witness and create transformative change that leads to true liberation. Poetry is, for me, linked completely to my spirituality, and I think spirituality for me is something that is essentially about breaking down binaries because I don't see the secular and the spiritual or secular and religious as two separate categories. For me, I'm really interested always as a poet, as an activist, as a queer person of color, as a queer Muslim, and as a person who does practice spirit in my own ways, in the kind of interesting liminal spaces between and beyond the religious and the secular, and breaking down those binaries, breaking down binaries of being pagan, any given day identify as pagan, Muslim, practicing, sometimes secular, sometimes a witch, Definitely always queer. I'm also mixed race and part of my family is Jewish. These are all parts of my identity because I don't think it has to be binary in any way. I really believe that my Islam is a place of self-determination. It's also really important and one of the things I really want to emphasize today is to understand that queerness and LGBTQ identities have a long history in Islam. 
Muslim cultures are not necessarily inherently more homophobic or less homophobic than any other culture. Every single community, every single culture has issues with oppression and various things that happen within it. And I just want to really kind of look at and debunk this myth about Islam being more inherently homophobic than other religions. And I think that's deeply embedded in racism and white supremacy. What we don't need as Muslim women or queers is invasions and occupations in our countries in the name of freedom and democracy. To support us, I would ask that you need to support our fights against imperialism, occupation, Islamophobia, white supremacy, not just homophobia and transphobia. They have to happen in tandem. To support Muslim women is to understand the multitude of our identities, to understand that some of us are with hijab, some of us are without, and some of us, some of us are beyond hijab, that we come in multiple and complex identities. It's also important to keep breaking down the binaries of good Muslims versus bad and think about as supporters and allies, what does that look like? Which Muslims do we think we should be supporting? And which Muslims do we deem to be outside of our support because we have a particular perspective on what an acceptable Muslim looks like? What does an acceptable immigrant look like versus illegal immigrants? Who do we support and who do we choose not to give our support to? Because solidarity can't be selective. I also just want to mention this idea about unity that I think has been floating around, particularly after the Women's March locally. I think it's really critical, again, to also break down the, uh, another binary, since I seem to be obsessed with them, is um, the binary of unity versus division and di dissension. And I, for me, it's really, really critical to not just talk about unity, but the strength of dissension that leads to growth, and how important it is to have dissension that leads to growth, and how critical and to me, the key movements that I've been part of and the key alliances and the interfaith organizing and connections that have lasted through the years are where I've been able to have that difficult, difficult work happen between us, where dissension has happened, where we've been able to challenge, where we've been able to come from those places, where it isn't just about one love and let's suppress the real problems that may exist with us, within us and uh, around us around structural inequality, but we're able to talk through challenge and work from there. So one of the other things Christine had mentioned in the questions she sent me was to talk about moments that gave me hope and ha give me hope in these very despairing times because I do think that it's absolutely critical to have hope. And for me as a poet, I feel like part of my role is to talk about the rage, the despair, and be, do that in a way that's unadulterated, but also talk about hope. So one of the things that I've been part of that has been a project of complete love for me has been Breaking the Fast. I'm one of the founders of um, this radical Muslim arts showcase that centers the voices of queer and trans Muslim, Muslim women that brings together Shia, Sunni, Ismaili, Ahmadi, other Muslims, and um, also brings non-Muslims into our arts showcase, the performance showcase that we have once a year. We also have a digital space and we've had Muslims from around the world um, submit to that. So it's really, really beautiful to have that kind of space of resilience and resistance, but also art and hope. And the focus is really on our own communities and building in as opposed to fighting out. And that was a really conscious decision on our part. One of the highlights of that space is we have something we've now called the horizontal prayer space where we have women and non-binary people leading the prayer and calling the azan, the call to prayer from the front, and men praying behind them. And I do also want to emphasize that this is nothing new. This is something that's been part of our traditions for centuries. It's just something that a lot of people don't know about. And it's really, really important to reclaim those kinds of traditions. I also wanted to mention two other examples. Um, after the shootings that took place at the Pulse nightclub and the majority of those impacted, which doesn't always, hasn't always come out after what happened, were uh, queer and trans people of color, particularly Latinx, Afro-Latinx people. After that um, tragedy happened, um, there was a lot of backlash towards Muslims as well, and obviously the Afro-Latinx and Latinx communities were grieving. And we came together as indigenous, black, uh, Latinx, and Muslim queer and trans people to create a space particularly for queer and trans people of color, indigenous people, and black people. We had a healing space that was just beautiful. We had an art table, people creating art. We had a, uh, prayer mats up on one side, Muslim prayer mats for people to sit on, not necessarily to pray, people of all faiths or no faiths. We had prayer, Catholic, Muslim, and Sikh prayers, um, 
a Day of the Dead altar, among other things. It was just a really, really important space for us to be able to come together. And it was partly in response to the fact that the mainstream events that were happening in Vancouver, including vigils and stuff, from the larger queer community were not reflective and felt very exclusive and really didn't have our voices represented. And so even in our grieving, even in our grieving, we were left out. And so we decided that we needed to create our own space of love and healing. I also wanted to uh, mention and express my gratitude in terms of another way that's kind of helped me continue and given me the inspiration to go on and the support I needed is the incredible support that I've personally received from um, Japanese, uh, queer and trans folks, mixed folks, and also Japanese Americans across the border, and also generally the ways in which the Japanese American community, Japanese Canadian community, has so incredibly and visibly risen up and taken a stand, especially internment survivors, talking about and making the links in terms of the Muslim registry that's currently on the books uh, under Trump and internment, and saying we're not going to let this happen. And it's been so powerful for me because I think it's a really, really solid example to talk about in terms of the kind of solidarity that is going to last for generations because it's coming from a place of understanding that our struggles are definitely unique but also connected because we're both communities that are being framed or have been framed as enemy aliens by the empire. And so it's been so... Just even seeing pictures of elders in marches holding up signs, survivors of the internment camp, has just been meant so much, saying that they're not going to allow this to happen to Muslims. And I think that's an incredible risk for people to take. So before I get into a poem, I wanted to end with what we can do tangibly and what you can do. Um, because I think it's really, really important. It's a question that comes up and people are looking to move beyond, I hope, just expressing allyship and move into tangible solidarity. Um, I don't know if this is a sanctuary church or not, but I think that's a very important place to start in terms of the sanctuary movement, in terms of giving sanctuary to refugees um, in particular. But I think moving beyond that concept into being a place of sanctuary for vulnerable bodies, racialized bodies, Muslim bodies, indigenous bodies, uh, queer and trans racialized bodies, um, that I think is really, really critical. And I've witnessed firsthand, having been part of some local queer Muslim support groups for refugees and trans folks, how important that's been to have that sanctuary in action. Also to continue this dialogue in various ways, to have anti-Slavophobia training, uh, bystander training, to understand and to remember, don't be a bystander, do something even if it's not perfect, and then follow up with the people that you're trying to support. What does that look like beyond intervening in the moment? To check your assumptions and privilege and understand that Islamophobia is a form of racism and it can be separated from that particularly this concept that's been around for some time, especially in the U.S., that I hope will take off here, is the idea of safe zones for Muslims and other racialized bodies and vulnerable bodies. The idea of, for example, talking to your neighbors, um, to coffee shops in your neighborhood, to public businesses, each one of you reaching someone else, um, to have these safe zones where people can have momentary sanctuary if something happens, where they're being harassed on the street. Because these are the realities that are happening not just in the U.S., but in Canada. In my community of Muslims, women who are wearing hijab, women who are not wearing hijab, queer and trans Muslims are facing escalations on a daily basis, having hijabs pulled off, being pushed, being shoved, physical and verbal violence, macro and microaggressions. So what would it look like if we could step into a space and know that it's safe for us, even temporarily for five minutes? What would that look like if spaces actually publicized that they were safe for us, for vulnerable bodies in our city? What would that look like if you talked to two other people at your favorite coffee shop and said, is this something you would consider doing? What if we knew that this is a church where we could walk in into this neighborhood at any point in the city when we were under attack and feel a sense of sanctuary? I, just to lastly end on the, you know, a point to say that a reminder that all of the examples that I've talked about, well, most of them have been in the US, but not all, but these kinds of things are deeply entrenched here. And a lot of my family's experiences, a lifetime of Islamophobia and racial profiling, including leading to my dad's heart attack at the border, have happened not just on the other side of the border, but very much on this side. And that's predated what's happening now and well before 9-11, well before. And that's not just when we were here as Pakistani immigrants without citizenship. And definitely citizenship gives us enormous privilege. But even with citizenship, that profiling has continued. My father's heart attack at the U.S.-Canada border happened when he was a Canadian citizen. 
and the border guards did nothing to help him in that moment, even though they had defibrillators on site. It was my mother who saved him in that moment, and thank God, literally thank Allah, he's alive. So to remember to step back and step up and take leadership from Muslims and directly impacted communities, and to just end on this kind of, what might be a challenging notion, but I think an important one is to move beyond the concept of performative solidarity, because I think often we may come from even a good place, but sometimes we don't realize that we're performing solidarity instead of actually enacting it tangibly. Get in the trenches with us because we need you for this struggle. Because if radical spirituality is really gonna be embodied, we have to actually act on it. Uh, on a last kind of tangible note of something that I would love to get support from, and Christine's gonna share the link, I believe, on Facebook later, is I'm currently um, co-organizing uh, co and will be co-facilitating a workshop coming up in February called Tomorrow is Ours. And it's for people of color, indigenous people. And it's looking at the concept of futurisms, the idea of building alternative futures with a limitless imagination for the futures that we want, a creative writing workshop. It's uh, unfunded completely. It's a grassroots uh, um, effort. And we are looking for uh, donations from allies, whatever small or big donations. I'm really incredibly inspired by what we've been getting from, especially within queer and trans communities, people who often don't have resources. But I would love to see that expand because what we're trying to do is ensure that we have and can offer seats to the very communities that often have financial barriers to accessing training like this because this comes out of our community saying to us we need as racialized people, as indigenous people, as black people, as people of color, to really imagine and find alternative futures and start building them for ourselves, otherwise we're never gonna have liberation. So on that note, I wanted to share a quick poem. This is from the um, Writing the Walls Down anthology, a convergence of LGBTQ voices, looking at the ways in which walls have played a role, the way we break down walls, spiritual walls, all sorts of walls, metaphorical and physical. I highly recommend this anthology, which is very critically acclaimed, that came out last year. If you can get a copy of this, it's an incredible, incredible resource. And this poem is dedicated to my father, and I wrote this for him uh, last year. When the skies were free. When the skies were still free, we shimmered. Hummingbirds melting into each other. Earth bleeding music into a lover's mouth. When the skies were still free, we never stepped sideways out of fear before entering a masjid. Never wondered if walls had informant ears, if the imam or the person praying next to us was working for the FBI. We never paused in the middle of a walk. You told me about a new Islamic center, hope vibrating in your voice, and the thought of finally finding community. Until I deflated your excitement with homeland security truths meant to make our lives feel like a lie. Spilled unwilling warnings about entrapment, detention, deportation. Fahad Hashmi, Afya Siddiqui, Guantanamo, Bagram, hunger strikes, force feedings, solitary confinements. Words pushing out of me, becoming concrete, cutting off the open air around you. Brick by brick, layers of fear spreading thick in between to cover any cracks that might let in spring days and the uncurling of cherry blossoms and hope. When the skies were still free, our spirits walked for miles, hand in hand, no walls of fear hemming us in, keeping each other out, eyes full of stars instead of impossibility. Your heart still beating in tandem with mine, before borders stopped its rhythm, tried to swallow you whole, deemed you criminal for daring to breathe while being Muslim. When the skies are again free, we will meet on a path laid with pink petals, rain 
falling in fragrant buds all around us. We will shimmer. Hummingbirds melting into each other. Earth bleeding music into a lover's mouth. And I have um, a recording of the azan done by a friend who's a Muslim woman that I want to play. It's just gonna take me a second. We're gonna try to hold it up to the mic and see if that works. I just wanted to end on this note, which is a call to prayer. Thank you so much for having me.